patients with extra hepatic disease. We're getting better at staging and we're identifying these patients and, and at least historically, these are a list of prognostic factors, many of you know, uh, presence of extra hepatic disease and presence of periportal nodal disease, another form of extra hepatic disease, were, are still important prognostic factors, but these have historically been considered absolute contraindications to proceeding with surgical therapy of the liver. But I'll try to show you some data to perhaps that a paradigm needs to shift with regard to focusing on whether a patient has extra hepatic disease. It really should be more a biologic, uh, based on biology. Well, here's some data on, on the, historically, on the, the description of extra hepatic disease as a prognostic factor. And there have been studies as, as remote as the, the report by Hughes in 1986 and others that have, uh, that have really promulgated the, the concept that if extra hepatic, presence of extra hepatic disease is present, that most patients don't survive a long time. Now let's speak first about the definitions. If you look at some of these older studies, even the studies that have advocated uh, uh, using extra hepatic disease as a prognostic factor, we see you need to think about how they're defined. Many studies, including some staging systems which included this, have incorporated the presence of tumor directly extending into adjacent structures as in fact extra hepatic disease or interlumer biliary extension, or regional local recurrence of the colon cancer. I think these are probably not what we really th should think of as true extra hepatic disease, but rather the, the, those on the up, listed on the upper part, pulmonary metastases, hyalonodal metastases, perhaps peritoneal disease, and other sites. These are really what we're thinking about when we define extra hepatic disease. You've already heard about the improvement in systemic therapies that have resulted in dramatic improvements in median survival, but also response rates and increasing ability to perform resections in patients with liver-only disease. We need to think about how we manage now patients with extra hepatic disease. And we can also talk about, perhaps if we, uh, later, to talk about how do we manage the, even the complete extra hepatic response, another area of controversy. So for, let's first talk about pulmonary metastases with hepatic metastases, not an uncommon scenario, patients that present with combined liver and lung. What are the data? Well, somewhat well, relatively limited. These are a variety of retrospective series reporting outcomes in patients with pulmonary and hepatic metastases. And you can see here five-year survival rates, arguably comparable. In fact, some are better than reports with liver only. How does one interpret that? Well, clearly it's a, it's a patient selection in identifying patients with this disease. But it just does suggest that that the presence of limited resectable pulmonary metastases in itself should not be an absolute contraindication to proceeding with surgical therapy. Here's a study from Memorial Sloan Kettering, again, a retrospective series looking at patients who have combined hepatic and pulmonary metastases, where you can see five-year survival rate. Of, here it's a shorter survival, a shorter follow-up period, but you can see here that uh, this is from the time of the second resection in the, con in the context of stage resection, that at least some patients may enjoy a relatively long uh, survival rate. When looking at the question of pulmonary combined with hepatic resections, you have to look carefully at the different series because some report patients who present with, with simultaneous pulmonary and liver metastases, and others report where a patient may have had a prior liver resection and now has the presence of a pulmonary metastasis. And we think about these very differently. The question may be to us, if we face a patient with concomitant disease in both sites, how do we manage those? This series, again, a small series from Italy, looked at this where they looked at the outcome of patients who had first liver and then lung resection compared to lung and then liver in a sequential fashion versus patients who presented simultaneously. And then one also needs to look at even if the presentation is simultaneous, does the, re the actual resection be performed in one operation, sometimes that, this can be done, or in a staged resection, much as you've heard about staged hepatectomies. Next, let's talk about the hyalur lymph node, the presence of metastatic disease in the hyalur lymph node. This is a question that's often plagued us in how we manage this. Here's a patient with only on PET scan found to have a hyalur lymph node positive disease. And while, again, here's an area where I think there needs to be a paradigm shift. This, in, until fairly recently, what had been considered uh, an, a, an absolute contraindication to proceeding with surgical therapy with curative intent. What are the data with regard to hyalur lymph node metastases? But again, as, you, as I've shown you before, early series published in the 80s and early 90s reported five-year survival rates of zero, which really uh, 
promoted the concept that really we should not be operating on these patients. But more recent studies, including some I'll talk to you from uh, Adam's group as well as uh, Elias's group, are now reporting survival rates that have increased significantly. This is the recent publication by uh, the Paul Bruce group looking at patients with hepatic and hyalur nodal metastases undergoing liver resection. And you can see that the survival curves here comparing patients who have liver with node positive versus node negative, and you can see that while the survival rates are significantly less, the, still patients enjoy a, a long-term survival and disease-free survival. In this study, they found that patients with um, preoperative chemotherapy actually uh, uh, had a, was not statistically significant, but had a, a diminished survival, but patients who had a response or stable disease to preoperative therapy, at least there was a trend toward improved survival in these patients. They found patients who were young, less than 40 years of age, had a significantly improved survival when combining, when resecting the perihepatic lymph nodes. And importantly, a concept that's been previously described, it really depends on the location of the hyalur lymph nodes. This was first uh, emphasized by, th by this uh, study from Yasek, who emphasized the distinction between really hyalur lymph nodes and retro retroportal lymph nodes compared to celiac or hepatic arterial lymph nodes, defined in this study as area one versus area two. When you look at the outcome of patients undergoing resection, comparing these two different echelons of nodes, the survival is significantly different. So I think it's fair to say at least the data support that in patients with periportal or hyalur lymph nodes, that if it's in a location that's in the, really in the portahepatus uh, or in the retroportal location, those patients should perhaps at least be considered for resection of the lymph nodes. Uh, combined with hepatectomy, where patients who have metastatic disease in the celiac axis, these patients really do very poorly. When looking at the presence of extrapatic disease overall, whether regardless of the site, again, here's a study uh, looked, uh, reviewed by Elias, where they compared the outcome of patients with resected extrapatic disease with hepatectomy compared to those without. And here you can see that really there was not actually a statistically significant difference between the two groups, reporting a five-year survival rate of 32% in the series as a whole, really bringing into question this absolute, this feeling that extrapatic disease should be a, a real contraindication to surgical therapy. Here, if you look at the study, when they further did the analysis, it was really the number of metastatic sites, whether intrahepatic or extrahepatic, that is associated with survival. So when they looked at the number of liver metastases within the liver alone, it correlated less with survival than the total, the total number of metastatic disease combining the sites, both extrapatic and intrahepatic. And you can see that patients with oligometastatic disease, regardless of the location, enjoyed an improved survival. So in conclusion, I think it's fair to say that patients with, for example, with pulmonary metastases, the data are clear, at least from preponderance of retrospective data, that the survival rates are comparable to that of liver-only disease, provided that the metastatic disease can be resected and the pulmonary metastases are relatively limited in number. The presence of hyalur lymph node metastases is in itself, I think, not a contraindication to hepatic resection, but the goal should be an R0 or complete resection of both the intrahepatic